So welcome, fathers. Mm. Thank you, Thank Paul. You, Paul. I'll try to make your lives very difficult. Thank you, Paul. If you are feeling guilty, then that's wonderful because whether you like it or not, that's the Holy Spirit crying out inside you and telling you, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. What if I don't feel guilty? So God, he's not like, you know, this, this dictator that says you have to do this. If not, I find sometimes trying to be holy or spiritual is exhausting. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just me being me right now. Yeah. And where I say it's a cop-out is there is nothing like today's generation that has access to content like this. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first podcast for COA. It's going to be the first interview-style podcast. We're very excited about it. We're very lucky to be here today with Father Gabriel and Father Anthony. For those of you who don't know, they are both priests in the Ottawa, Montreal, and Eastern on Eastern uh, Canada Diocese. Eastern Canada Diocese. Sorry, that's going to happen a lot. Uh, and um, I'm here to make their life very difficult. Uh, it's terrifying to say, but I'm going to try to play devil's advocate with two priests that are wearing crosses that are very heavy. <laughs> um, and that's going to be my purpose here, to try to stir a conversation, try to develop something edifying about difficult topics at times, other times not difficult topics, but topics that are always on our minds. So before we start, we have Father Anthony, who's been a priest with us in this diocese since 2014, Father Gabriel since 2012. But the important thing is we have two priests with us that have always lived with us in Canada, have been born and raised here they know about the struggles of the youth they work with the youth even before they were priests they served the youth so it's nice to have because when we're speaking we don't have to pretend like they don't know or they didn't go through the same struggles or the same hardships and that's really important to us when we tackle these um topics so welcome fathers thank you, thank Paul. you Paul. i'll try to make your lives very difficult thank you paul uh, one other thing they both have <laughs> masters in theological studies uh, Father Gabriel graduated from McGill in mechanical engineering. Father Anthony graduated from the John Molson uh, School of Business. So they're both rivals. We'll try not to have any <laughs> fistfights. And uh, that's it in terms of introduction. So today we will be tackling music and entertainment, something very important to all of our lives because it takes a lot of our time. So right off the bat, let's start. My first question, why? Why do we have to look at everything through a spiritual prism? Can't something just be fun once and for all? Yeah. Um, something can definitely be fun. There's nothing wrong with something being fun. I think what's concerning is the way that we pose the question almost makes it seem as if being spiritual is an additional layer that you have to consider. When in reality, the human being is what we call psychosomatic, right? He is both soul and body. So being a human being means that you are always doing something that is going to relate back to your spiritual life. Because you are a spiritual being, whether you like it or not. So to suggest that you can disconnect the spiritual from your person when you do something that you render to be not spiritual doesn't make any sense. So everything will have a spiritual implication, whether you like it or not. I understand, but if I may, Father, can... Do you understand the guilt that that kind of puts on someone when they want to just enjoy a show or listen to music? It's difficult because I can know that something has vulgarity in it as a as a song or as you know music, or that something has inappropriate scenes as a movie or a show or killing or whatever it be. And if you're telling me no, I can't separate from my spirit, you're essentially telling me, you know, be okay with it as long as you can bring it with you into church, for example. Is that what we're saying? I think what I'm trying to highlight and what the church has always taught us is that for you to suggest that you could put aside the spiritual in anything that you do, then what you're falling into is that trap of there is stuff that is secular and stuff that is spiritual. That is not how we live our lives. A human being is not meant as a Christian to wear two different hats, that sometimes I am secular, sometimes I am of the world, behave the world, enjoy the world. And there are other times where I act as if the world is bad and has to be shunned and I don't want to bring in the spiritual because in doing that, it makes me feel guilty. If you are feeling guilty, then that's wonderful because whether you like it or not, that's the Holy Spirit crying out inside you and telling you, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. And what if I don't feel guilty? <laughs> then that's a conversation between your father of confession. <laughs> I think we have to remember the reality of who we are. 
right? Uh, so, sometimes, again, like like Father Anthony was saying, we live these divided lives, but in reality, we are created in the image of God. So th- this is a reality, and we always forget that part. So if I want to do something that will be affecting me in a negative way, well, it's a choice that I have, but but it will affect me in a negative way. So it's not necessarily something that I can consider doing without understanding the repercussions. So what I'm trying to say is that if you have, if you think that as a person, as a human being created in the image of God, I can actually do certain things without negative repercussions. When God himself calls them sin, then I'm living in delusion. So, so forgive me. What if I'm not doing something negative? I'm coming home from work. I'm coming home from school. I just had an exam. I want to watch a show. It's funny. It's going to have inappropriate content, jokes, whatever it be. I want to listen to music in my car ride home, coming home from school again or work or whatever it be. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm letting loose. I'm relaxing. It's very difficult. It's difficult for me to say, okay, I have to shun everything that, you know, what would Jesus do? What would Jesus listen to? What would, he wouldn't watch what I'm watching. It wouldn't be appropriate. Right, I'm. I'm not denying that, but that's that's a tough task, don't you think? Especially in the world we live in, that that's a tough ask, is it not? I mean, I understand that it's difficult because so much in the world now has become increasingly dark, right? Meaning sinful, right? Um, and I just so I understand the challenge there, but at the same time, again, we have to remember or differentiate at least between what is secular yet clean versus what is sinful and harmful, right? So, so there are certain things. So you're saying, I want to let loose. And that's fine. Everybody needs to relax once in a while, me being the first, right? That's something that, that, that is good um, and needed, absolutely. But if I'm going to start tapping into what is sinful to relax, hmm. that in itself is problematic because, yes, I might relax now. I might enjoy something now, but... On the long run, and, and especially on a spiritual level deep within, there's going to be negative repercussions there, right? And, and, and at the end of the day, what I'm doing is not really relaxing. However, if I'm tapping into clean, secular music once in a while, albeit it's not necessarily defying, but it's okay. I mean, it's, it's, it's not sin as a whole, right? And, and there's different levels of spiritual lives between one person and the other you know to, to to one person he can do a bit of clean secular another he needs a lot of clean secular versus what is holy and what is edifying right mm-hmm. and that is okay i mean we, we are all very different and we have different needs but in doing so we should not be making what is wrong right mm. we shouldn't pretend that this is okay this is fine and often what we do is that we we say things like, well, everybody does it. Mm. And I get that, but, but if I say everybody does it, what is the implication? So who holds or who is the source of morality at this point? Right? Is, it, mm. is, it, is it the people? Is it God? Right? So it's definitely a challenge. So I don't want to come up or come across uh, as very you know, stringent and, and it has to be done that way. That's not the case at all. But when it comes to that, that line, right, that red line, when I step into sin, I think we have to understand that this line should not be crossed as much as possible. So, Can I actually jump in for yes, a second? Yes, please. There's something that Father said that I think is really important. Um, there, there also has to be enough wisdom and discernment to be able to understand that not everything is segregated into what is good and what is bad. When we talk about things that are good, there is a spectrum even there. Mm. There is good, better, and best. Mm. If you want to talk about what's best, then yes, absolutely. We should find comfort and enjoyment and even entertainment in the things that are edifying and spiritual in their context. Mm. Take that just one step lower. You can then move to the secular that still has a spiritual benefit, and yet it's not entirely immersed in the hyper-spiritual. What is good? You can still find stuff that is secular, not blatantly spiritual, but still, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with it. There is good, better, and best. What is dangerous is when you start going to the other side of the spectrum. There is bad, worse, and worst. Mm. 
If you start navigating into the bad, worse and worst, you shouldn't be in that category at mm -hmm. all. There is sufficient content in this category of good, better and best for you to be able to still find that freedom that you speak of. So then let me go into the middle category and the, the not so good category, okay? The question we get asked a lot is, what if my moral compass is good? What if I'm, you know, a father, I have children, I serve in the church, I, you know, I, I guide youth, whatever it be. But I know my moral compass, I know what's right, and this show is not great. It has whatever it has in it, or this music's not great, it has what, and I know, I, I won't be promoting it, I won't, but it's something that I enjoy. I find it funny, I find it entertaining, there's war, there's this, there's that, doesn't matter, we don't have to go into details, but my moral compass is solid. What's the danger there? If you permit me, Father, I, I think um, there's a huge difference between the work of the Holy Spirit inside of me that is objective, that speaks truth, that says this is sin, this is <clears throat> not sin, right? Versus my own personal moral compass, right? That could degrade with time. It actually not could, it does degree with time. The more I expose myself to sin, even if I think it's little sin, right? It degrades with time. And that's quite problematic. So again, I don't want to be too harsh on this. I, I am very much pro people um, consuming clean entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. And I think everybody needs this. Again, me being the first, like I said. However, <clears throat> as Christians, we need to stop pretending as if God is not holy, right? So, so there's a reason that God says, um, be holy like your Father in heaven is holy. And when God says in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So, so why is it that the ones that are pure in heart are the ones seeing God? It's because God is pure. And I, I'm meant to be in his likeness. So, as long as we stop playing this game, essentially, and, and, and stop pretending this, I think, I think we could look at the wide spectrum of, of type of entertainment and, and be wise in choosing what is clean. Because if my objective is heaven, then I think everything falls in line. If my objective is pure entertainment, regardless of the repercussions, then we have a problem. If I uh, may ask you something, Father just to be brutally honest, I find sometimes trying to be holy or spiritual is exhausting. Mm. Mm -hmm. And and that's just me being me right now. Yeah. It's exhausting because it there's so little left. Everything has been, you know, desensitization of sin mm. is everywhere, in everything. So it's exhausting. Where do I find it? Where do I go to look for it? So it's almost like the easier path is, okay, I know my moral compass is decent and I'm just going to enjoy it. Like I'm tired. You don't have to, you don't want to have to work for entertainment too. That's the last thing I want to do at the end of my day. So if someone comes and tells you I'm tired, you know, don't tell me read scriptures all day long. It's not going to happen. We're all exhausted at the end of the day. Don't, don't tell me listen to hymns all day long. It's tough. After, you know, someone's trying to look and they can't find purely good entertainment. What is there? What is the answer to that? And, and, and maybe I don't know, but where do we go? What does that mean you can't find pure entertainment? Is, is, that, is that a reality? Or? I mean, it's becoming more and more a reality in the world we live in. And that, again, goes back to the spectrum. For someone, there might be zero if that's how high their spiritual compass is, right? For another, it may, everything may be okay. I feel like to find truly, like, even when I go back, and I don't want to, you know, promote shows, but the shows we used to watch when we were younger, you know, like, remember TGIF, you know, like, the, the things we thought were innocent, you know? And you watch them now, there were some problematic things. You wouldn't let your kids watch it today. No, I would not. <laughs> I would not, but I watched it, and that was the entertainment on a Friday night, and we were innocent and didn't really understand the concepts in it, but that was then, and now we're here probably 20, 25 years later from that time, it's gotten a lot worse. There's very little. There's very little left. Maybe I can propose something uh, on a general level, if you permit me. But, yeah. I think that each person 
with the advice of his father of confession, he needs to draw like certain lines for himself. Again, with the advice of the father of confession, right? So, so similarly to what Father Anthony said, to me, there's three categories, right? So there's on this side, the edifying, right? What's going to really help me build my spiritual life. We have in the middle what's neutral, right? And we have here what is sinful. So, you know, if, if I live in this world, Okay, so, so maybe I need to progress towards that side, right? So I need to, the idea is that I need to be walking towards that side, walking on the path of sainthood. So if I am able as much as possible to maximize this part, the, the defying part, right? That's beautiful. And that's what everybody needs to be doing. However, that level or that percentage could vary from one person to the other depending on where they're at, right? The one in the middle needs to be minimized as much as possible. However, that means that if half my time I am I'm watching secular clean stuff, let it be. Okay. And and the sinful part I, I need to eliminate as much as possible. But again, depends where I'm at. If I'm drowning here, that's okay. So let's do let's do some progress. Let's just start walking towards you know, my sanctification, right? So I don't think it's a one answer that fits everybody. I think there is, a, you know, varying degrees for each person. But at least I have to be willing from within to walk on that path, right? I don't think that on Judgment Day, I'll be able to stand in front of God and use things like this as excuses, meaning, well, it's everywhere, God. What do you want me to do? <laughs> I won't be able to, right? So, so God says, I, I understand, <clears throat> but I've also given you clean entertainment. And okay, we're weak. We fall. That's fine. I think there's a huge difference between, okay, I'm tired today, right? Or I'm just weak. I fell. Versus, I think this is fine. This is where I have a problem. Is when I think, when people say, I think this is fine, and therefore giving themselves the green light to go ahead with this. This is very different from weakness. So I shouldn't be relying on my moral compass. My moral compass doesn't mean much, especially if it stands in contrast to God's commandments. I think that that's a big one for me. I don't know, Father Anthony, what do you think? I think there, there is something to be said about how it is that it's a complete cop-out when we say stuff like there's nothing out there. That's simply not true. Mm -hmm. It's simply not true. So let me, let me use myself as an example. When I need to go numb, I've had a, a long day, it's been very difficult, and I, I just want to watch something to just help me shut down my thoughts, I'll go watch the highlights of the last basketball game. I have no problem doing that. Absolutely. Right? I'm really into woodworking. So a lot of my like, YouTube feed is woodworking or basketball or... I love all of these YouTubers who do cooking. Like some of these guys are amazing. One guy called Guga. He's really good. Okay. <laughs> Shout out to Guga. Uh, Guga, but, wherever you are, whoever you are. <laughs> he's amazing. Hilarious. But anyways, all of this to say what there's there's content that's completely neutral, right? Um, we're not suggesting that you have to immerse yourself into everything you watch and do has to be Jesus, 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 Jesus. If if that is who you are, that's incredible. Mm. And you are at a spiritual level that is absolutely wonderful. But for people you, for, who are like you and me, it's perfectly fine for us to be able to turn to things that are completely neutral. There is nothing sinful about it. And it's not necessarily immersed into theology and this and that. And where I say it's a cop-out is there is nothing like today's generation that has access to content like this. Mm -hmm. There is so much content that is edifying, so much content that's online that like w when we went through COVID, it, we flooded the internet with so much incredible content. So let me just do like a segue into, because we've been talking about content and, and shows. How about this same discussion, but with music? That one's even harder, right? Because if I'm not listening to Christian music, music's going to be either about relationships or broken relationships or about whatever it be. That one's even harder. And even the beats sometimes could be problematic or cause, you know, different emotions to stir into someone because that's kind of the central theme, right? Whether love or falling in love or lust or whatever it be. But 
that one's even more difficult. So what about the people who want to listen to their music and it's just the beats or the words or they're not even, they couldn't care less. It's just about, you know, music. Is that one just as bad? <laughs> I would honestly suggest that, again, in today's reality, we have so much choice and so much selection. And at the global level, the internet has made everything so incredibly accessible. Where if you did want things that are more edifying, you can find whatever you want. Today, there is, there is different forms of music that are perfectly acceptable. And there is nothing wrong with your playlist being filled with things that even some things that are secular who don't hold a bad example in any which way. The, the things that I tell a lot of the people that I will counsel spiritually, I'll tell them, I want you to imagine that my young daughter is in the car with you. And you're driving her home. Mm, that's good. And then your playlist is rolling in the background because it's your car. And then you get to this one song where you suddenly feel the urge to like reach for the volume and like shut it off really quickly, right? Because you don't want my daughter to hear mm. that very specific song. That should tell you something about how that song doesn't belong on your playlist. Because if you're not okay with my 11, 12, 13-year-old daughter hearing you or hearing that song being played, then why are you so worried about her soul but not worried about yours? If we vet our playlists in that way, then you'd be shocked as to how much we would remove from our playlist. Why? Because we recognize that music affects the soul. And we know this to be true. Why do you think athletes will listen to a specific type of music before they go into competition? Yeah. Why do you think that people play certain types of music when they want to relax and be peaceful? Because music affects the soul. The church knows this so much that we have hymnology. We use music to put us in a state of prayer. And we recognize that some music is completely all about emotionalism, where it's all about appealing to entertainment and emotions, while others actually lead a person to a state of reverence and a place of worship. So we know the effect music has on us. So when people say stuff like, Abuna, I promise you, I don't even care about the lyrics. I'm literally just listening to it because I like, I, I like the beat. Yeah, but you have the option of getting the instrumental. You didn't get the instrumental, did you? <laughs> right? Here's another thing that's really interesting. the non-explicit version. Well, but even then, you know exactly what they're blurring, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. I'll tell you something it's else that's blurred interesting. blurred out, it's replaced. <laughs> yeah, with a really interesting <laughs> word. <laughs> but anyways, <laughs> what I find interesting is that I'll tell people, for instance, try to memorize the Psalms. The Psalms are really good for the soul. You know, like, Abuna, I got such a bad memory. Abuna, I can't, I can't memorize the Psalm. But Drake drops a new track tomorrow. And Everyone. by the next day, everybody knows the lyrics by heart. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting how memory gets better mm -hmm. when it comes to things that you find entertaining? So I'm just saying. In fairness, the, 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 the lyrics just keep repeating themselves. It's not that hard. <laughs> the Psalms are very difficult, Paul. <laughs> no, I get it. Is there any evidence or is there any you know, knowledge you can give us about how it impacts the soul or how vulgarity or whatever it be can affect someone emotionally or psychologically? Christ was very explicit on this when he was speaking in the Gospels, and he talks about how even a little leaven, a little leaven, will leaven the whole lump. I'm not sure how to say which one works. Yeast, okay? right? Yes. We just right? use yeast, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, what does it do? It affects the entire lump, mm -hmm. right? Um, if I baked for you a cake, and I told you, listen, there's, just, there's, there's somewhere on the top of the cake where I just put one drop of cyanide. But listen, like in comparison to... The rest of the cake, That's right? In comparison to the rest of the cake, it's literally less than 1%, right? The rest of the surface is perfectly edible, right? The problem is that when you, when you don't recognize the danger of you constantly exposing yourself to things that are either inappropriate or blatantly in your face sinful, then you're not recognizing how it is that there's one simple rule that applies in all things, even at the level of psychology. Whatever you allow in is exactly what you're going to allow out. One of the fathers that I serve with, he constantly says this saying, uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? Mm -hmm. If I fill this cup of water with water, when you knock it over, what falls out of it? Water. Why? Because that's what you filled it with. If you keep filling yourself with things that are inappropriate and sinful, in moments of stress, when you are knocked out, what will come out of you? Whatever mm -hmm. you filled yourself with. So the idea of it's only for the music, it's only for the lyrics, it's only for the this and that, it's just because it's so entertaining, it's just because, but you're filling yourself. Mm. Can I add to that? Yes, please. We are what we eat. 
not only that's physically that's a very big problem <laughs> yeah not only <laughs> physically but spiritually like that that's the gist of what father anthony was was talking about so but what i eat or consume through my senses and my thoughts really affects mm. who i am there's a couple of things here we have to realize that as christians first and foremost we need to carry the cross if i want to live a life of resurrection we know the cross is difficult we know it's difficult nobody wants to carry the cross everybody wants to escape and avoid the cross again me being the first but it's still a reality if i want to tap in into the resurrection of christ then i have to carry the cross especially through my senses so if i allow the darkness to come in through the windows of my eyes right right the eye is the lamp of the body right through the windows of my ears through my thoughts and it's just i'm repeating these same thoughts these same lyrics you know these swear words what do you think is going to happen then we put all this mud on the work of the holy spirit the fire of the holy spirit inside of us and then we scream god where are you <laughs> God, I'm not hearing you. And I'm pointing the finger and I'm blaming him and this and that. And I feel anger and anxiety inside. All this for the sake of relaxing, really? Like on a psychological mm -hmm. level, we want to relax on a spiritual level. We fill ourselves with all of this mud. So I, this is of extreme importance. And I think St. Isaac the Syrian like has this beautiful, beautiful imagery where he compares a person that is under the water, right? So he's saying the person that is immersed in the water is not able to breathe the air, right? Obviously. Mm. And he compares this to the soul. So the soul of a person who is drowned in worldly thoughts, drowned in darkness, similarly is not able to tap into the spiritual realities of the kingdom of God. So, so this is how it is. We are created in the image of God. So, we, we have to be holy as much as we can. And like Father Anthony said, garbage in, garbage, right? So, so knowing this, knowing that I'm throwing mud on the fire of the Holy Spirit within me, you know, it raises a huge flag. Like, what am I doing? Because the reality of my well-being is first and foremost founded on my spiritual life before the psychological life. They are intertwined. But the foundation is spiritual. So I could be exhausted physically. I could be exhausted mentally. Tomorrow I'll, be, I'll feel better. If I'm drowned spiritually, that lasts and drags for weeks and months and, and try to go up that mountain, that spiritual mountain, up to God again, it's not necessarily an easy feat. Um, you touched on something that's really important and I'm starting to see it a lot in the world we live in where anxiety and depression is hitting mm. earlier and earlier. You have children that are not even teenagers talking about anxiety and then teenagers having depression and anxiety. And part of me almost feels like, is this because of the overwhelming weight of the desensitization of sin in the world or not? And I'm sure the answer is affirmative. But if you can touch on that, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who experience this that there is a weight to not having spirituality in your life, and that may be causing this imbalance in all of us to feel more anxious or to feel more alone. Of course it does. It is absolutely affirmative. Um, again, like, you know, God's commandments are given to us to remain in His image and to be in His likeness. God's commandments, very simply put, are the manual of operation that he gives to tell us how to function. So if I have the same thing from my car, right, but I refuse to change the oil, I refuse to change the water, whatever it is, right, the transmission oil, engine oil, whatever it is, right? So the, the car is not functionally functioning properly. Well, whose fault is that, right? So again, it's not about blaming anyone here, but this is the purpose of God's commandments. So when I choose willingly to, to avoid them, and I choose willingly to, to, again, desecrate my soul, 
this is what's going to happen. It's a natural consequence of this disobedience. So God, he's not like, you know, this, this dictator that says you have to do this if not. Or no, God, God says, I love you. I've created you. I am the source of life. I am the source of love. I am the source of everything that you desire. But I've set between you a path that leads to life and a path that leads to death. Because, because I am love, I have to give you this free will. So, so, but choose properly. Sometimes we only focus on the big sins as if these things don't matter. But the reality is that these small sins end up leading us to bigger and bigger sins. And the accumulation of the small sins in themselves become very problematic on a spiritual level, which hits the psychological, right? It affects it. And therefore, there is depression, there is anxiety. So if you think about it this way, like when I tell the youth, you know, like when people want to break God's commandments, so I'm like, why? Like you, you think the world has freedom? Right. Are you jealous of what the world has? You think they can do whatever they want and you're jealous of that? Well, look at the end. Look at the consequences, the ramifications of these decisions. What happened? Depression, anxiety, suicide rates up the roof mm -hmm. and still growing. Okay, so why, why can't you learn from the other person's mistake? Why can't you fill yourself with God? Again, everything, you know, done properly at your level, I don't want to sound extreme, but enlighten the world. Show them the joy of Christ. Become the salt of the earth. Why do you want to imitate the neighbor that is in darkness? Become the light, right? Yeah. Yeah. There is also something to be said about how it is. We must absolutely teach our children to recognize just how fake everything that they're drowning in is. Mm. There is so much that is seen today that our kids are consuming, whether it be through, you know, whether it be TikTok or YouTube or whenever they're on social media and Instagram, everything that they're seeing is positioned in a way where you're only seeing a very specific angle of it that we all know is fake. Do you remember growing up, we used to have those cameras where you had to wind them up to be able to take mm -hmm. pictures? Do you remember those? Those were fantastic. You had like 24 shots that you could take. 24 shots. And once Most you took, important 24 shots of your life. Absolutely, yeah. because if you miss the moment, you miss oh, the moment. It's not like selfies today where you can take 12 and pick the best one, apply a filter, make everything look like it's nice and dandy. There is something that we have to teach our children and all of these young people about how it is that like all of this is counterfeit. It might look like a real bill. It might look like it's actually a $100 bill, but it's counterfeit. It actually has no value. Why? Because it's made for it to look like it's appealing. But in reality, that person who is portraying themselves as happy and joyful and successful and can have whatever they want, exactly like Father said, what is the end of all of this? Why do we see so many people in Hollywood who are hyper successful mm. in this and that still choose to take their own lives, mm. live in slavery to addiction, whether to be to substances or to fame or this and that? Why do we see that? Because in the end, despite the fact of having the appearance of looking like they're happy and successful, there's an emptiness, a void that only God can fill that no matter how much fame or popularity or money you throw at them, it doesn't satisfy the person. It's all fake, empty. Yeah. So you brought it up, but I forgot to mention in the beginning, both fathers have young children. So you brought up children now. Our church, I mean, everyone could see you're dressed pretty traditionally. We're a traditional <laughs> church. Both have beards. Giant cross, you know, music and our church. Where is there a place, if any, to bring modern day music or beats or entertainment or anything that's modern for that much into a, such a traditional church? Are you talking liturgical settings or? Both. So start with liturgical and then go into the non-liturgical. So liturgical setting, I'm a firm believer. If nothing is broken, why are you trying to fix it? We received something from the apostles. And those who came before us have handed down to us a method of worship that has led us to be able to reach a point where we have 2,000 years of holy men and women who are saints. The liturgy, I'm just going to say, like, 
very blunt. The liturgy is not about you. Mm. The liturgy is not there to entertain you. This is so. This is such a an important but, reality. But Father, sorry, liturgy as a word, it means the work of the people. One hundred percent. And the people now are in twenty twenty four. Yes. So, where is the room for them to evolve? Is my question. Name one. Name one other church. Who, when you walk into the liturgical setting, the entire congregation mm. is chanting. We we have this one month in the Coptic, in the in the Coptic liturgical cycle, called Kiyah. Mm -hmm. During the month of Kiyah, <laughs> the, the entire building will shake because of mm. how many people are praising all together as an act of worship. The work of the people is not to be entertained; it is to worship. Now you'll even notice that in our church during the liturgical prayers, even the priest won't look at you. <laughs> the priest is giving you his back. Why? Because it's not about us. It's about us coming together and looking towards God. And so if, if you're coming in hoping to be greeted, hoping to be looked at, to be entertained, to be addressed, other than the sermon, everything else is an invitation to keep your gaze at God. That is your posture. So as far as liturgical goes, no, this is not the place for innovation at all. What about hymns, like in terms of communion hymns and things where people have to come together in worship? Yes. Right? We try to bring our children together. We try to sing, you know, English hymns that they can participate in. Is there at least a vehicle? And I'm not saying we're going to start, you know, bringing a boombox or, <laughs> you know, some MP3 player with, you know, some modern music on it. But is there no vehicle for that? Is there no place for that? If I can add to what Father Anthony said, um, I remember, I can't remember when this was, but maybe two, three years ago, I heard this Protestant youth actually say something that really, really stuck to me. So he was describing his first uh, entrance or entry in, into an Orthodox liturgy, right? So he's com he was comparing his own world as a Protestant Christian. Right versus the Orthodox one. And again, I'm not belittling anybody here. I'm just saying what he said. Um, he was shocked. He was shocked in a good way. So he's like, I'm walking in. I see like Father Anthony was saying, everybody's looking at Christ, right? Or at the altar, right? Seeing all the icons, seeing the incense, right? Remembering the book of Revelations, right? Understanding or seeing this made him feel that he was somewhere else. He just stepped into something that is completely different. And that's what liturgy is, right? So when you talk about liturgy, liturgy is the anaphora, right? The lifting up to God, where we are around him, along with the saints, the body of Christ, both those in heaven and those still on earth, united around their God in worship. And that's exactly how he felt. And he was comparing this or contrasting this with his own reality, saying that I feel in the Protestant world, it's different. It's like the world is there and it brought the world in the church. So I, I'm, not, I'm not going up. It, it's the same level. I might be trying to, to make things a bit holier, right? And again, I'm not belittling anybody, right? But, but this was the way he, he saw things. So like Father Anthony is saying, it is worship and it's worship to God. It's not worshiping ourselves. So it's not about ourselves. So in that context, or, or in that light, we should understand and be okay with the fact that the liturgical hymnology and the prayers are not done in an earthly way. It's meant to be heavenly. Now, this is a different discussion uh, than language, for example. Of course, I mean, the more, in my opinion at least, the more we understand what it is that we're praising, right? So the more things are in English or in the local language of the country, the better, right? Because we, we raise our hearts to God in true prayer. And we have to get our kids used to this. So I think there is room to play because these rituals and, and these hymns are not a big T tradition, right? It's not the holy tradition of the church that makes it or breaks it, right? It's not mm. the faith. It's not about this. These are means to get to what is essential, so there is flexibility there. However, the purpose should not that I need to bring the world in the church. It's I need to go into liturgy, go to heaven, participate in heaven. Liturgy is a mystery in itself. Eat God in the Eucharist, go out and enlighten the world and infuse the life 
giving God into this world, right? What do you think? Just as a clarification, yeah. though, did not some of our hymnology at one point in time come from the peoples, whether it be pagan or whatever it be at the time, that we wanted to embrace in the church and give them familiarity, almost like a St. Paul to the Roman, I was a Roman kind of thing? Definitely. I think, I think there is something to be said about how historically the, the tunes that we hear were a representation of the culture that the apostles grew in, mm. right? When St. Mark came to Egypt and he brought the gospel to Egypt, he allowed them to be able to express themselves according to what it is that they knew, right? Now, the church has a responsibility to be able to take what we receive and to be able to deliver it, exactly like Abuna said, especially when it comes to language, in a way that it can be received, dissected, and properly embraced by those who come into the church. Where it gets a little bit difficult here is, I want to go back to something you said originally in the question, Paul. You talked about how it is that our kids and specific beats that they are accustomed to and everything revolved around this idea of what they typically would assign to what is entertaining. Now, to be clear, even at the time of the apostles, there were things that were happening that people can clearly distinguish between what brings about reverence and what brings about entertainment. They were capable of discerning that. What you heard in liturgical prayers, the tones, the tunes, the very movements of the music that is found in liturgy was not the same that you would hear in the marketplaces. Mm. So the idea of bringing what is in the marketplace, again, and this goes back to what Father Gabriel was saying, you're not going to bring what is typically in the marketplace into that place where it is designed for worship and reverence. If we can't distinguish that, then we have a problem. You'll even notice that in the Coptic Church, we'll use symbols and triangles. People think we're using them as instruments. And we even have a problem where some deacons will go all out and they'll start using it as if like, you know how when you're playing a guitar, you can go solo really quick and just have your own like moment? No, no the symbols is not used for that. The symbols was actually <laughs> used in a way to be able to keep tempo. It wasn't meant for you to drown out the voices, right? Because again, the whole purpose was to be able to get everybody, the entire body, to focus together on praying these things to God as an act of worship. It was never meant to be entertainment. If we do want, however, outside of liturgical prayers, to have choirs, and in those choirs we're using pianos and violins and guitars and basses, why not? There's nothing wrong with that. And, and this can happen where we allow our kids to also express themselves creatively through music as an offering of praise to God, and at the same time it be done to please their parents who want to come and listen to these beautiful children who have practiced and done these things. There's nothing wrong with that. That cannot and should not necessarily be in, something that infiltrates into the liturgical. Because even the liturgy should not be an opportunity to put our kids on a platform. The only person at the center of the liturgy is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Outside of liturgy, no problem. Can you just define for those who don't know, when you say liturgical services, what does that, what is that defined as? Beginning where, ending where? So when we speak of liturgy, Again, like you said, the word literally just means the works of the people. But when we're talking about the rites and the rituals of the church, we are talking about any formal prayer that the church has created um, a very specific form to be delivered in. So this can be the divine liturgy. It could be matins and vespers. It could be the liturgy of the waters. It could be the baptismal prayers. It could be any form of prayer that has a very specific form that has been created and written down into the church as a very specific um, expression of how it is that we pray these specific prayers. Outside of that, though, you have a Sunday school class and they're about to start uh, their, their session and you want to get them into a spiritual setting. You're going to do a few songs of praise. No problem. You want to have the piano present? You want to have the guitar present? Go ahead and do that. Because this is now simply praise. The act of worship and liturgy has to be treated differently. So we've covered music. We've covered shows. We've covered music in the church. Next, I want to tackle something that's a bit problematic, and I'm sorry, I want to just let everyone know that it's kind of taking a, a turn in left field. They might not be too prepared for it, but <laughs> media, news, mm. we are in a world that is extremely fractured, extremely divided, and no, we're not going to go into a left and right and Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, that's not the point. I don't even think that would be edifying. Mm. 
what are the undertones, the red flags that people, because now, okay, you're telling me, don't go to the shows, don't go to the music. I want to turn on the news. Surely I can turn on the news and that be something that, you know, takes my time or gives me, provides me with information, entertainment. What are the red flags? What are the undertones? Because for the first time since COVID, I think the last couple of years, we were even seeing satanic themes in news and and different, you know, marketing campaigns. For mm. the first time I saw there was a marketing campaign that tried to, you know, almost glamorize Satan and Satan worshiping. And yeah. so if you can just tell us, what are we looking for in terms of media, in terms of undertones to be watching out for? I think uh, satanic worship is, is definitely on the rise and it's quite scary. Um, actually, funny enough, I came across this thing, this new show called Pauline on Disney+. Plus. Okay. This show is about a girl that has a relationship with the devil. Right? And she, she through that, she has some sort of superpowers and it, it just goes about it that way. That's the narrative, the gist of, of the show. Another show that is quite scary to me because it's a cartoon, also on Disney Plus, funny enough, right? It's it's rated for adults, but it's on Disney Plus, right? Um, you have the devil that also has a relationship with a girl and he they give birth to the Antichrist. The Antichrist is a girl 10, 12 years old, obviously within the show, she's disobedient, she's rebellious, she's like all of these things. Like So so it's like in your face. Mm. It's in your face. And if we talk about the, the music culture, Father Anthony, all, all the stuff we were discussing, if you want to share the insanity of these things. Yeah, and we're, we're, seeing, we're seeing the glamorizing of the devil in a way that we've never, we've never seen before. It's a whole other level of desensitization. There's, there's, Artists now who are coming out and in your face doing things that are explicitly satanic, right? Um, so there's this one artist by the name of Little Nas X. Mm. Comes out with a pair of shoes uh, that sold out within like seconds. He personalized them. He's got a verse that is basically put, the, the reference of the verse is put directly on the shoe where it basically says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. He has 666 and an upside down cross put on the shoe that is in black and red. And he's got a drop of human blood in every single one of the shoes, right? Um, and I think it wasn't even done with the consent of Nike. And Nike got involved and basically said, we don't condone this. And I think, anyways, there was a whole bunch of stuff about that. Why are we, why are we doing that? What, what are we exactly are we trying to do? He later on comes out with a song uh, where in the, in the music video, he takes the crown of Satan and claims it for himself. A little bit later, he comes out with another song where he claims to be the second coming of Christ. And in, in the actual video, he is explicitly doing things that are absolutely unacceptable. If this was done under any other banner of religion, the man would have been canceled instantaneously, but he gets away with it where, again, we are in your face, anti-Christian, in your face, Satan worshiping. We, we saw an, a, such an unfortunate thing happen, even at the level of like these these pop stars and these music artists and these actors and actresses that are coming out and even saying about how it is that they as a couple will drink each other's blood. Same. Like, we're, we're literally talking about a couple who comes out and says, like, we're not condoning this, but we do it. And it's, and like, we're, we're, it's not like we drink a lot of each other's blood. We're just doing this almost just as a personal ritual, an intimate ritual between us. What are we, what are we doing? I, what I is think, happening? I think the word ritual is key here too. 100%. 100% and, and like we're, we've only scratched the surface if if you start going into like all of these things that are done subliminally and if you start taking a look at some of the lyrics and all of the music videos and people dressing up like demons it does not end what i find fascinating is that we are not the only religion in the world that believes in the existence of satan or the devil yet in all of these cults the religion they always go after mm. is christianity it's almost like Satan is not paying attention to anyone except the Christians and blaspheming Christ's name. And that's my personal opinion. But it's slightly worrisome that these things cannot, like you said, go 
unnoticed if it was with any other religion. It and, would be unacceptable. But blaspheming Christ's name, blaspheming our Bible, the Word of God, blaspheming everything that we behold as holy, is fair game. So let me push this even to a further extent. And I know this wasn't your question, Paul, but you're spot on. Even to the point where if you actually speak to people who are ex-Satanists, people who worship the devil, what is the only religion that they go after and they care about? Christianity. Why is that? What is, what is that supposed to tell you and me? The warfare is real, and the younger generation has to come to the realization that we can't live our lives thinking that the media, that the music, that the entertainment, that all of pop culture is not influenced by some sort of spiritual warfare. So to go back to your very first question, let's stop acting as if there is nothing spiritual happening. There is always something mm -hmm. spiritual happening. And, and I think that it's also uh, hiding behind the idea of paganism. I think there's a rise of paganism, a push for paganism. Not only it's, it's fully satanic in your face, but it's also hiding, hiding behind that. Remember the Commonwealth Games? Yes. Yeah? Remember like this huge bull, the huge bull that comes out and people are worshipping. Like did you see this? I did not. Yeah, no, it, it was insane. Like It's not even hidden anymore. No, no, no. It's, it's terrifying. The Commonwealth Games. So, so this is like the uh, introductory or the opening ceremony and people are worshipping the bull. It's full, full on paganism. In the show actually that I was mentioning about the cartoon earlier, um, they interviewed the cast. The women, the, one of the women, like the, the actors, she, she came up, she, she was wearing this red dress. She had, you know, the, the fork of the devil, right? And she full blown saying, I'm so proud of this show because it does promote pagans. I've seen videos of, of Hollywood stars gathering together. And before even they gather together, you see certain clips of situ certain rituals that they do, how they're sometimes barely dressed, sometimes not dressed at all. Um, and they sit down in these gatherings and, and, and one, one, at some point I was like, why? Like the, they had a cake. The cake was shaped in a human body. Full cannibalism, right? And like, like you eat it, like you cut for it. Why, why? why? Why is this happening, right? So these are all the same people. And a lot of it is hedonistic, right? It's like seeking displeasure i don't want to talk too much about these things but but there's a lot of things and every time you see that type of worship like it was in the old testament there's always this hedonistic activity that is right there in the midst of all of this and you see it all the time like it, it, look at any any video clip of, of any right so again it's it's so not innocent like what father anthony was saying so Going back to the beginning of this podcast, you know, and telling ourselves, oh, well, I'm so tired. Like, no, you don't understand. There, there's bigger spiritual movements that are, that are hidden within this. And that should scare us. Not in the way that we're going to be scared, but scare us enough for us to be cautious not to allow this input to come with us because it is devilish and it's scary. I was going to ask you about horror movies, but it doesn't seem like a good <laughs> idea anymore. <laughs> Well, think about that for a second, right? What better way to desensitize our kids to evil so that evil now becomes categorized as entertaining mm. than introducing it through the form of movies, right? Um, if the devil wants to hide in plain sight when he wants to possess people's lives, right? Then why not get them entertained to the idea of them watching movies about exorcism, right? Why not hide in plain sight so that one day, if they actually meet a person who is demon possessed? Then the response can simply be, right? This stuff is only for movies. That's Hollywood. That's not real. Or even just glamorizing fear. One hundred percent. I mean, if if love casts out fear, right? Very well said. Very well said. If the solution to fear is love and God is love, then where do you think fear stems from? Right. The wild. That it's so in front of us. Mm. All the time. Yeah. Okay. So I think that takes us to the end of where we wanted to go today. Um, as a little summary. Now, does anyone want to summarize? Shall I summarize? I think what I took out was discernment, but you go ahead. Paul. I, I, I want to share, <laughs> um, if it's okay, a story of Father Arsenius. Mm. Um, 
many of us don't know Father Arsenius. You know him better than both of us, actually, but we hear so much of him, and he was a saint in the Montreal churches, a beautiful man. Um, and you would know very well, Paul, how poised he was. You know, and everything he did, he did very slowly. Right, the way he would pray, liturgy was slow. Mm. The way he would walk was slow. I would hear when he would go around in, in the round of incense, it would take him forever, right? The way, like, everything he done was so poised and so holy. There's this one time, this one time, I remember, it's so imprinted in my mind. I was stepping out of the chapel. That was before the priesthood. And I saw him talking to this lady. And for the only time in my life, I saw him just turn around and run. Have you ever seen him run? Never. <laughs> run. I'm like, what did this lady just tell him? I'm like, this is why he was a saint. The man was fighting, in my mind at least, the man was fighting for his purity, right? I don't know what is it that she was saying, but it's something that was, you know, hurtful enough to his spiritual life that he ran away. So as priests, we don't run from people. Like if you, if you swear at us, if you scream at us, okay, we're there to take it. That, that's fine, right? But so he would never run from these things. And, and the father of Sanus, she really carried his cross. Mm. That's why he lived a life of resurrection. So the only, the only logical conclusion is that the man was running away from something that was impure that this woman wanted to tell him. Right? And I think as Christians, to whatever level we are at, we have to remember this. Again, something comes to mind about St. Isaac the Syrian. He says, if you want to endeavor like in your spiritual life if, if you want to take it seriously right this is the path that will lead to sanctification and that sanctification will allow you to tap into the mysteries of Christ so we have been created and designed to live real life real life and real life is not this life can you please stop pretending that real life is this life right so real life is, is really found in God and it's so beautiful, but we have to tap into him. But when we desecrate ourselves, we become lukewarm, then God's commandments become very heavy. Christianity becomes very difficult. Why? Because you're trying to fulfill commandments and yet there's no joy that, are, that is associated with these commandments. So you remove the joy from Christianity and it becomes quite heavy. So I think if we can imitate Father Arsenius and what he has done as much as we can, because again, we're all at different levels, I think that will allow us to tap into Christ and to really start living Christianity and becoming the light of the world. Uh, that was a perfect ending. However, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So we might have to open up a whole <laughs> mm -hmm. other can here. But what you said was lovely this is the real life and i mean both of you have dedicated now your lives you've left kind of not left the world but left work to work for god and but you know what it was like before i go to work people go to school they have families they have you know kids they have homework exams they have things to do with work it seems that life is so busy and that so much of life I don't want to say is apart from God, but the requirements for life are not really spiritual. It's stuff that we have to do day in and day out. That it's not because I believe that this is the real life. I know very well that it's eternal life. But it's almost like it becomes an afterthought in the hustle and bustle of every day, mm -hmm. the business of every day. And that is the answer I'm looking for. How? How does one take this as the temporary when it takes so much time compared to the eternal? How? In the life of St. Anthony, at some point, uh, the Lord wants to reveal to Anthony someone who is living even a holier life than him. Mm. I know where you're going and don't tell my wife the story, but continue, please. <laughs> really <laughs> hope she hears the podcast. <laughs> no. Um... So he's taken in the spirit and God reveals to him a man who works as a physician in the world, takes whatever he needs to survive, gives the rest to the poor, 
And it says, and every night he praises with the angels. So the idea or the misconception that the only way to live with God is to leave everything behind and to have this like image in your head of, I have to go really deep into the desert. I can't have a role to play in the world. Like, I love the way that you began by saying, you know, like, the rest of us have wives and no, children. No, I didn't who are mean like, it that way, but you know what I mean. Like, like Paul, I got a wife and children, bro. I understand. Okay. Okay. But, but at but, the end of the day, you go to work in the church with God. It's easier to remember God. And the problem is, is as long as you believe, as long as you believe that you're only tapping into life with God when you go to church, mm-hmm. then you're the one who's missing out. So much harder, though. It is. We can't deny that. It is. It's no, so much harder. Actually, I want to invite you to make sure that you deny. Why? My father, confession, used to tell me when I was in school, he used to tell me, when you study, you are a priest. Your books are the offering. Your desk is the altar. You offer it to God. Because if you do it for yourself, that is not living for God. When you go to work, every time you meet with someone, you have a, you have a responsibility in that moment to ask God to be able to work through you so that you are an icon of Christ, even while doing your mundane task. If anything is done outside of God, then you have separated yourself into the secular and to the spiritual. And here we are. We've come full circle yet again to disassociate the spiritual life and to dissect yourself in a way where you are separating the spiritual, my life with God, from what I do in the world. This is where we fail as Christians. You being a Christian cannot be limited to when you pray or when you go to church. Everything is an offering to him. This is why the Lord himself begins his ministry by saying what? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Meaning what? The kingdom of heaven is right here and now. The term at hand literally means it's there. You can reach it. You can grab it. If you live as if the kingdom of heaven is later, it's outside of your reach, then you don't get to taste his glory. Do everything. Your work. Be a father every day in Christ. Be a husband every day in Christ. Be a son or a daughter every day. In Christ, be a student and an employee every day in Christ. To act as if I do the in Christ stuff only at certain times and certain moments, then we are failing to be Christian. And, and that's why Christ told the Samaritan woman, right? It's not about praying in Jerusalem anymore or on Mount Gerizim anymore. Yeah. It will become a time where you take the altar with you, take the liturgical altar with you wherever you're at. It's very easy to say, theoretically. Both of you have not coached nine-year-old girls basketball teams because you would not be... I used to. <laughs> it's impossible. And it's not, no, I'm just It'll kidding. It'll teach you patience. I'm just kidding. Yeah, funny. But I'm sorry. I'll take them everywhere. But nine-year-olds basketball, it's not going to work. No, I'm just we'll, kidding. We'll Continue. give you that one. We'll no, give no. you that one. That's fine. <laughs> Continue. Sorry, I cut you off. But... No, no, that, that, that is what I wanted to say. I, I think we have to take the altar with us everywhere as much as you possibly can again we are human beings so it's very difficult to pray 24 7 even within the liturgy the two hour three hour liturgical service nobody's able to be focused that much but do what you can at the level you are at and it's that simple just to clarify the story i didn't want father to say about saint anthony is there's another one about a woman who takes care of her children Mm-hmm. And God sent St. Anthony to go see how faithful she is in caring for the children and for the house and tells St. Anthony, basically, she's better than you are. And my wife likes to tell me that all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't go there. So I guess to conclude, we've for learned a lot. Time, yeah. What's that for the second time? Maybe third time? Depends on what yeah. comes up. Yeah. I took discernment, discernment and entertainment and relaxing time, but bringing Jesus everywhere. I mm-hmm. think that's... Can we say that maybe the theme for today is bringing Christ along in our entertainment, in our work, in everything that we do? Mm, Absolutely. Fathers, do you have any last words to say? It was great. Absolutely. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, What a blessing. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.